This is La Pizarra, a place where we explore creative minds in the entertainment industry on both sides of the mic and the camera. Here is your host, Nikki Mondellini. Welcome to another episode of La Pizarra. I'm your host, Nikki Mondellini. As far as voiceover marketing coaches go, Mark Scott is right at the top. He's a Canadian powerhouse with a successful coaching business and an equally successful voiceover business. Mark is also the host of the Everyday Viopreneur podcast, where he shares some of the best advice that I've ever heard on how to run a successful voiceover business. And many of the things that he talks about can actually be applied to any creative business, as you will hear. He will share some of those golden nuggets today, so you won't want to miss this episode. If you're enjoying La Pizarra, don't forget to subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to us now. And I would be very grateful if you could give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so that other people can find us. If you're interested in listening to our previous interviews, you will find them all on nikimondellini.com slash podcast. I will link to that in the show notes. And I invite you to sign up for our bilingual monthly newsletter, where you can find previews of new episodes as well as tips and resources for your creative business. And now let's explore the creative mind of Mark Scott. Mark, welcome to La Pizarra. I am so glad that you're joining us today. I'm excited to be here, but I, I telling you right now, my Spanish is awful. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, a lot of my audience is bilingual, so they'll be very happy to listen to you in English as well. So no, Excellent. no worries about that. No <laughs> worries. You know what? I, I consider you uh, one of the godparents of this podcast, because if it wasn't for you telling me to put boot to butt, I would have never started this podcast in 2020 when I did. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever been referred to as a as a godfather of a podcast, but I, I kind of like that actually. Yes. I feel like I need to get that on a t shirt. Yes, but yes, you are. I think it's I think it's awesome, and I'm glad that you actually did decide to to do it because I mean, it's you've had the opportunity to interview a lot of amazing people, and I'm sure that's been not only a huge benefit to your audience, but a, an incredible education opportunity just for you alone. I mean, I learn yes. something every time I get to interview somebody on my podcast. Right? It's it's amazing. And I get so excited with everything that, that, that my guest is sharing. I just want to blast it to the world and like, did you listen to what they said? You know, yeah. <laughs> just pay attention, yep. you know. So yep. the, definitely. Um, but uh, okay, so I want to I wanna hear some of your beginnings because you've talked a lot about the way you started, you know, uh, that you were in radio, jumped into voice over, but I, I think I've missed the way you actually started, like what got you interested in radio in the first place? Uh, Casey Kasem. I, oh. when I, when I was a kid, I, I spent every weekend, like many in, in you know, my age listening to, uh, Casey's countdown, American top 40 yes. or whatever. And, and that was like one of the, the go-to things. And I legitimately thought this dude has the greatest job in the history of life. He literally works four hours a week right now. I didn't know what goes on behind the scenes sure. at that point. Yeah. I just knew he was <laughs> on my radio for four hours a week. And then when I discovered that he was the voice of some of the characters on Scooby-Doo, which was my favorite cartoon at the he time, was? I was like, okay. I did not know yeah. that. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was, he was, he was shaggy and, and, oh. you know, did bit characters and stuff like that on, on the Scooby-Doo cartoons back in the day. And yeah. so I was like, okay. Well, that's it. He's the, I got to be I want to be Casey Kasem when, <laughs> when I grow up. And so the goal was to to, you know, end up with my own syndicated countdown show and only have to work four hours a week. And, <laughs> and I thought that was going to be uh, I thought that was going to be my dream life. And, uh, I can I can say that I have had the opportunity to do several syndicated countdown shows now and in radio and in television. Really cool. Uh, but not a single one of them afforded me the ability to only work four hours a week. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I would imagine not. Yeah, that, that's not the, the reality, sadly, but it's not. <laughs> and then you, you develop this really, I mean, you're one of the faster talkers that I've ever heard with such eloquence and such diction. How did you master that? I have no idea. I <laughs> I just make it up most of the time. I don't, I, I've gotten really good at just making it up. You know what? I think one of the things that I am grateful for is when I started in radio, this is going to make me sound really old now. I'm going to have a complex over that. But when I started in radio, my first station, it was live 24 seven. Like, where does that happen wow. anymore? Right. Yeah. Everything in radio now is practically recorded outside of like morning shows. Yeah. And so I think that that was probably really good for me being on the air, being live in the moment 
interacting with callers, like you've got to be quick on your feet in, yes. in order to be able to, to do that. Right. And, and doing morning radio, I did morning drive, I, I did afternoon drive. And so there's a lot going on in a live show that makes you be quick on your feet, quick to think, quick to act, mm. quick to respond. I'm sure that was, that was definitely a big part of it. And then, I mean, I, I read like everything constantly. And so now my head is just filled with useless knowledge. And so now if you take you know, two, two decades of live radio experience and then couple that with all of the useless knowledge floating around in my head. It just makes it really easy for me to just talk a lot about whatever. <laughs> yeah, come on, not whatever. You're one of the more practical persons that I ever know. I mean, you hear somebody talking to you in, in your coaching sessions and you're able to put two and two together and then just see a sequence of things that that we're not seeing. And so yeah. you've helped a lot of people that way. So, I, I mean, that that's great. But going back to radio, I think uh, a lot of people that I've heard that started in radio that now have the, their voiceover business, they just say that it's the best school that you can have for, for voiceover. I mean, to get started and to really do a lot of that. And I think a lot of it has to do with what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, honestly, I I hear some people, I've heard and talked to voice actors who have been like, yeah, I'm a, the background in broadcasting was amazing. For me, it felt like a curse because hmm. radio announcer, right? <laughs> Show me one voiceover that wants an announcer anymore, right? Yeah. Even the specs that call for announcer don't actually want an announcer. The challenge that I had was, and, and I still struggle with, I haven't been on the air. My, I did my last radio show in 2011, I think. So I'm, you know, I haven't been on the air in a decade plus, and I still struggle sometimes with that 20 years of, of announcing and, mm -hmm. and trying to get that out of my system. And so that's certainly been a, a, a challenge for me uh, to try to overcome and, and, and try to get away from that side of it and get more into the acting side of it, which is a huge struggle for me. Oh, I, yes, I see. I see what you're saying. I mean, it helps you in a lot of other ways and to be eloquent and all that. But but yes, just changing that little chip in your head, the delivery, the delivery right? into changing being, the delivery like, to mm -hmm. what they want now. And, right. Yeah. I had the background like I had the background for the production side of things and the editing and all of that sort of stuff, which was amazing. I didn't have to learn any of that sort of stuff, but I've definitely struggled more on the the transition from the announcer to the actor, to the actor, whatever yes. you want to call that transition. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet you found a very nice groove in, in e-learning explainer videos yeah. and all of that. You know, it's just uh, that that's that comes very naturally to you. Well, and that's been part of it, right, is just uh, identifying my strengths and, mm -hmm. and being able to just dive in to that. Right. I. I, you know, you're not going to hear me on video games or doing animations or characters or anything like that. Cause I, I just, I know it's not my sweet spot. I know it's not where my, where my money's going to come from. And so I was able to figure out, fortunately, I was able to figure out early on where I was a fit and just double down efforts on, on those different genres. Like you said, e-learning explainers, things of that nature, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not the sexy national commercial, you know, <laughs> Super Bowl ads or whatever, but you know, I'm making good money and paying my bills and having fun doing it. So. Exactly. And learning a lot, you know, like you say, yeah. I mean, you learn from every job that you have and it's, it's, yeah, it's sure. just amazing. And now um, we're going to start talking a little bit about developing that business mindset. And when did mm -hmm. that happen for you? That made like, oh, man, it's like a point, like a, you know. Like the I've, I've been motivated by money for a very, very long time. Uh, <laughs> right, right or wrong. I mean, I remember as a little kid, I, you know, I had a, a baseball card business. I had a bicycle repair business. I had all these cool. different things that I was doing because I was very, very motivated by money back. So back when I was a kid, you didn't have, nobody had a video game system at home. You, you, you just didn't have that. You, you rented a video game system for the weekend and rented a couple of games with it. And, and so for me, I, I was driven by my ability to rent a video game system and get a large pizza and a two liter bottle of Dr. Pepper every weekend. And so, you know, you got to have money to make those things happen. And so I've always, you know, since I was probably 10 years old, I, I've had different jobs and stuff like that. And I've, I've always worked and I've always had that that drive. And then I guess over time, I, I've been able to, to channel that and harness that a little bit more productively. I've had to work to learn the entrepreneurial side, right? I mean, it's one thing to, you know, have jobs, work, make money, earn and all that sort of stuff. It's a very different ball game when you're 
running the whole entire business or whatever. Um, yes. But being motivated by money to, you know, I want to pay my mortgage. I want to take care of my kids. I, I, you know, I don't want to say no to my wife when she wants to do something. So I want to be able to have the, the earning to back that up, which means I got to have the business to back that up. So then how do I build the business to, to back that up? And so I'm, I'm, my brain never stops. Like, you know, I'd be laying in bed at two or three o'clock in the morning, thinking up the next idea or the next big thing I want to try or, or whatever. And so, uh, and, and that comes partially too, I guess, from being a voracious reader and, and just constantly looking to absorb the knowledge. Yeah. And, and you certainly have, and you've, you've developed a great course, which is the, the voiceover marketing playbook. When did you first come up with, with the whole thing, the concept for the course? I mean, the first course that I ever created would have been the, the blueprint of voiceover success, which would have been the, that was the precursor to playbook. Uh -huh. That was probably around 2015. And I think for that, when I was first starting to go, when I first went full-time in voiceover, I was trying to figure out what I was doing. And I, and I remember reading um, Crush It by very Gary Vaynerchuk. And one of the things that Gary said in that book was, you should write a blog. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to write a blog. Well, what the heck do I blog about? I don't know what to blog about. So I started blogging about everything that I was learning as I was trying to grow my voiceover business because I was making a lot of mistakes, doing a lot of dumb things, trying to figure out how to correct those mistakes and whatever. And so I was blogging five days a week for three years or more. Um, and it was just the journey. Really, if, to me, it was documenting the journey from idiot voice actor that knows nothing to, you know, voice actor who's starting to build a business for himself. Like, that's what it felt like to me. Uh -huh. To my audience, it felt like here's a guy who's made all the mistakes and now he's teaching me how to not make those same mistakes. And so after a few years of that, I get to a point where people are reaching out and asking me, can you help me with this? Can you, can you coach me with this? Can you teach me that or, or whatever? And so take that, I guess the market is calling for it at that point. Couple that with the entrepreneurial side of me, the, you know, trying to find a different income stream side of me and, and then thinking like, yeah, you know what, actually, if I pool all of the knowledge that I have from all of the dumb things that I've done and all of the lessons that I've learned along the way, maybe I can package that into a course and I can genuinely help people because that was a big part of it for me too. I, anybody that's worked in radio that hasn't worked in radio in, you know, New York or LA or Chicago, like the money's, the money is not great in radio. They didn't tell me that when I applied to, when I said I wanted to do radio in high school, they never told me that I was not going to make any money. Uh, and so getting into voiceover and, and being able to grow a, a business and really take the the limits off of my earning potential because it wasn't just a boss telling me what my salary was going to be like. That was life changing for me, like massively life changing. And so I, I just thought if I can help another voice actor figure out how to do that for them and their family, I'm going to do that all day long. And so that was where the first course came from. And as the demand grew for that course, it was like, okay, well, what else do I know? And what else can I teach? What else can I share? And so then that evolved into playbook and, and it evolved into some of the other classes that I've done and, and the coaching that I still do to this day. And it's all driven by a desire to help voice actors experience the success that I've experienced and, and be able to know that life-changing success and, and, and the positive impact it can have on your family and your future. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I can speak for a lot of us uh, that are thankful that, that, that you do have that drive and that, and that you do want to help a lot of people because you have, uh, not only through Playbook, you have your free advice Friday, which is amazing. And for people that are just starting out and that don't have or that are already investing in equipment and other things and to have that resource on Fridays where they can ask you questions, then they can listen to your podcast. And I think it's a great uh, resource and a great place to, to learn and grow and, and of course, you know, that's very much appreciated as much as your 12 gifts of Christmas. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so enjoyable. <laughs> I think all of these things, it's all, 
I guess the one thing I get asked all the time is, are you not worried about creating competition for yourself? And I never really thought about it that way because I've always thought about it as if I can, if I can help voice actors to run their businesses better, to me, that's better for the industry as a whole, mm -hmm. right? If, if you've got voice actors that are being more professional, that are conducting themselves in a more professional way, that are handling their business in a, in a more entrepreneurial way, that the, in the way that they approach rates or quotes or customer service or all of these different things, to me, that just makes the industry better as a whole, which is ultimately better for all of us. And, and I genuinely, I know it sounds really altruistic and, you know, let's all hold hands and, you know, sing Kumbaya, but I, I genuinely feel that way. I, and, and that is genuinely what motivates me. Definitely. And I think another thing that is true is that there is so much work out there. I mean, there's yeah. there's no way that that you teaching other people to be successful is going to create a lot of competition for you. No, there are a lot of businesses that need voiceover in many different genres. And there's new ways where, where people can need voices now for their business. And so uh, there is a lot of work out there. But I think that you doing it in a in a way that you're helping people to do it the right way and be professional, know what to charge, know how to put yeah. the best audio out there and, and yep. just... Uh, raise the bar for everything, everyone together. I think that is a, a really wonderful thing because it's, it's very much needed, you know? Well, and I mean, I'm, if I started my first coaching class in 2015, it's 2023 now, and I haven't put myself out of business yet from a voiceover standpoint. There you and go. I've trained a lot of voice actors, right? I've had the privilege of working with and, and coaching, whether it's that they've taken one of my classes or they've done private coaching with me or whatever. And, I, and I'm still here and I'm still working. So I, I, I guess I, I haven't created enough competition to put myself out of the industry yet. No, no. <laughs> Before we go on with the interview, I want to tell you about Squadcast, the platform that I'm using to record most of the episodes of La Pizarra. Besides having excellent sound quality, your guests can join the session from a computer or their mobile device from anywhere in the world. All they need is a stable connection. Squadcast has now joined forces with Descript, the editing platform that generates a transcript while you are editing. Now you can open Descript directly from Squadcast and start editing video and audio right away. Check out all the details at squadcast.fm slash question mark ref equals sign La Pizarra. This super long link is in the show notes. And once you click on it, you can try Squadcast for free for seven days and you can decide which plan best fits your needs. Squadcast has other advantages like the possibility of having up to nine people in a recording session or in a virtual meeting. And you can download your mixed and mastered audio files with Dolby sound quality. Try it out with a link in the show notes. And, and I've seen a uh, playbook, how you uh, developed it and you, and you keep doing uh, updates, which is wonderful. And uh, one of the things that, that you've updated is, is regarding social media. You, you used to say in, in the beginning, you know, when, uh, when a lot of things were going out there, uh, you know, Instagram and Twitter and whatever, you're like, okay, pick one and, and really be profic proficient at that one. And you weren't using Instagram that much and you really didn't see that much of an, of an interest in it. But, you know, you've evolved with it. You've seen it grow and change. And now, my goodness, I mean, you've done a lot of wonderful things with your Instagram account and you're there and you show great videos. And uh, so, you know, how do you think that that... Uh, has evolved and, and, and in what other ways are you evolving your business as, as a whole? I mean, I don't think you should ever get complacent. I don't, I don't think you should ever get comfortable. I think there are so many different tools that are out there that are available to, to any voice actor. And so I try, I try to give every one of them at least the benefit of the doubt, right? Like, you know, I, I signed up for TikTok and I played around with TikTok a little bit and And ultimately, I decided, you know what, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'm going to devote my efforts somewhere else. But I wanted to try it. I didn't want to just say no. I want to, I want to try it. I want to play with it, right? Mm -hmm. I've played with Instagram Reels. I've played with YouTube Shorts. I, I spend time on LinkedIn. I spend time on Twitter. I do Facebook. I, I run my Facebook page. I run my Facebook ads. I run my Facebook group. Like I do all of these things partly so that I can teach it, partly so that I can learn it, partly so that I can you know, find advantages where there's advantages, connect with people, connect with audiences. And so uh, I still stand by my advice that 
if you're feeling overwhelmed by social media, you don't have to do all the social media. I still think that the best approach is to find that platform or maybe, you know, those two platforms that that you really resonate with and that those will work really well with you. Mm -hmm. But I also think that for some people, I'm one of them. I got to play around with that platform a little bit to know. I don't want to just make a decision and potentially miss the boat on something. I, I got to play around with it. I got to try it out and see, yeah, this works for me. Or I think I can make this work for me. Or here, you know, I understand where this might be an advantage, right? So at the end of the day, I'm a LinkedIn guy, right? I'm, I'm a LinkedIn guy all the way, but I still use Twitter every day. I try to use Instagram every day. I'm still doing content on YouTube regularly. I'm still popping up on Facebook. Like each platform, I've found a, a place for it to fit into my business and, and a purpose for it to serve in my business. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's great that you do that. You test it out and then then you can teach it and you could talk about it uh, with firsthand knowledge. And th yeah. that's all that we need. Um, I want to talk about a few points that... Um, that I learned from, from your courses. And I think it's, it's going to be good, like for my um, bilingual audience that maybe haven't heard of you uh, before and just telling them, okay, these are a few things that, that you probably need to take into account. Um, one of the things that really helped me is about going after uh, payments, late payments with clients. Okay. And um, you talk about how People, it's not that they don't want to pay you. Sometimes you have to make it easy for them to pay you. Can you talk yep. a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think we have to be really careful about how we approach payment issues in general because money is a very personal thing, and everybody's got a very everybody's got a very personal relationship with money, and every one of those personal relationships with money is probably slightly a little bit different. And so, for some people, if somebody's not paying you for a service that you've provided your default instinct may be to get angry or to get protectionist or, you know, you're, you're taking food from my family or, or whatever. And, and when you come at it from that angle, it can sometimes just make the situation worse because, you know, there's, there's a thousand reasons why somebody hasn't paid you, but only one of the reasons is that they're trying to screw you. The other 999 is that there's, you know, legitimately something going on there. So I do think that it's really important. And this is where, you know, studying entrepreneurship, understanding business, I think that that comes into play, not approaching it from the acting brain because mm -hmm. the acting brain tends to be a little bit more of the emotional brain. And maybe you need to get into the business brain and a, a little mm -hmm. bit more of a, a logic brain, I guess, to, to would be the way to say it. But definitely, I, I definitely think that some of the things that we can do up front, I mean, first and foremost, the more ways that you have to get paid, the easier it is to get paid, right? Um, I understand voice actors who say, I don't want to use... I don't want to take credit cards because there's a fee, right? You got to pay your 1.9% plus your 30 cents or, or I don't want to use PayPal because you got to pay your whatever it is, you know, 2.9%, 30 cents or, you know, all these sorts of things. And so, you know, if you want to pay me, you got to pay me by check or you got to, you know, you can only pay me by deposit or whatever. I mean, if you only offer one or two options, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get paid, right? I, get, I don't care how the clients give me the money. Just give me the money, Right. If it's credit card, fine. If it's PayPal, fine. If it's bank transfer, fine. If it's check, fine. If it's Western Union, fine. I like whatever. It doesn't matter to me um, because I just want to make it easy. And and I I definitely found like one of the smartest things that I ever did for my business was accept starting to accept credit cards. Mm -hmm. Now, do I do I lose a portion on every one of those payments? Yes, I do. It's the cost of doing business. It's you know they're provide. I provide a voiceover service and expect to be paid. Well, the credit card company provides a service. Don't they deserve? to get paid, like if they're making it easier for you to get your money. Yeah. When I started accepting credit cards, my average payment on invoice dropped by almost 10 days. Like it was crazy how, how much fast, because it's just convenient, right? Yes. Everybody's got a credit card. Most people have points credit cards now, right? And so it just made it really easy for them to, to, to make those payments. And so I think that's a big part of it is just making it easy to, to get the money. I think that's the first and foremost. But I do think that it's absolutely important. How you communicate is really important, right? If you have net 30 days on your invoice, right? You want your, you want your payment 30 days. On day 31, stop threatening to sue or, you know, call collections. Like, you know, relax. There's, there's a legitimate reason for why that payment hasn't come. And again, it's not necessarily that they're trying to screw you. It's just whatever, 
They forgot it slipped through the cracks. They passed the invoice on to somebody and that person went on vacation. Like I said, you know, a thousand different reasons. And so I think that's a really important part of the equation too, is, is just, you know, being able to, being able to take a breath, be human, be patient, solve yeah. a problem. Exactly. Yeah. And, and just, uh, you know, gentle reminder or friendly reminders here and there. And then, yeah, don't, don't think, oh my God, they don't want to pay. Of course, you know, now I'm going to have to be chasing them. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been like, uh, since, since I understood that I, I started to relax a lot more whenever a client, uh, was not on time with their payment. And then I just, would send an invoice, you know, or, or follow up uh, email and just say, Hey, um, do you need more time? You know, uh, we did this yeah. a month ago or did this slip through the cracks? You know, yeah. maybe, maybe you missed this one or whatever. Right. Yeah. Think about how you respond. If somebody comes at you aggressively, how do you respond? You, you, you get aggressive, right? You're, you, you get defensive, you get your, defensive. your back goes up. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you're coming at, at, at a client from a payment standpoint that way, where you're getting aggressive, you're threatening collections, blah, 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 blah. Like, first of all, you're probably never going to work for that client again. And second of all, it's just going to take you that much longer to actually get the money. If I send them an invoice and be like, hey, you know, I just, I noticed that this one's, you know, we're, we're at, you know, 40 days, uh, you know, payment was supposed to be on such and such a day. And, you know, I figured you probably just, you know, it slipped through the cracks or maybe you just forgot about it or whatever. No big deal. Just wanted to pass the invoice along again. Right now they feel guilty. They're like, oh man, what? Why, why didn't I pay this guy? And then they, and yeah. then they flip me a check, right? Like that's so much better than coming and being like, you're 10 days late and I'm going to start charging late fees. And I'm talking to my lawyer and collections is coming up and right. Yeah. You, you don't have rights to my voiceover anymore. I don't, but I see voice actors who handle it that way. And that I think comes back to our relationship with money, which, you know, that's something that every one of us has to work on. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about was just developing that, that mindset of, or getting rid of the fear, I would say, of writing marketing emails. A lot of us have that, that artist mind that you were talking about, and yeah. we don't like to brag. We don't want to be bugging people. And so, um, you, you have a, a great resource for that, you know, where, where you have, a in like templates for, for email marketing, you give a lot of great ideas, but what is one thing that you can say that that can get people to lose that fear of, of writing those marketing emails? The biggest mindset shift and, and not just with marketing emails, just with marketing your voiceover business period is to remind yourself that you have a valuable service that is going to make somebody's life easier or better, right? When I am reaching out to a production company who I know is creating e-learning content, and I know they use narrators on their e-learning content, me reaching out to offer them e-learning narration for their content, that makes sense. Hmm. I'm not trying to sell them, I don't know, popsicles, right? Like, that, which may, they may or may not use. I know that I have a valuable service that I can offer that is going to be beneficial to their business and to their clients. And so why wouldn't I be excited about introducing them to that service and giving them the opportunity to take advantage of it. I think so much of our, our belief around sales comes back to sleazy, you know, used car salesman, shyster type people. Mm. And when you mention the word sales or you mention the word marketing, those are the images that we conjure up. And is it any wonder that we don't want to do it at that point? But, but that's not what you're doing. If I go out and I sell and I, I try to sell my voiceover services to just a thousand random people on the street, well, that's icky because 995 of them probably don't need my services. But if I'm intentionally and strategically targeting companies that I know use people just like me day in and day out, what do I have to feel bad about? If I'm going to make their life easier, their job easier, I'm, I'm easy to work with. I'm fun to work with. I'm fast. I deliver a great product. I, you know, like I have nothing to be ashamed of in the service that I offer. So I have no problem reaching out and telling people about it. Exactly. That's the first thing or like one of the main things that we need to think about. Just lose the fear and yeah. think about all of what we offer and, and, uh, and just think, okay, yes, well, they don't need another voice artist reaching out to them. Well, yes, they do because it's you. You have a yeah. unique voice, a Maybe style. Maybe the exact voice that they've been looking for. You don't yeah, know. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And I, I think the other part of that then too becomes every voice actor, if you do enough marketing, 
it is inevitable that you are going to reach out to the exact wrong person on the exact wrong day, and you are going to get a nasty reply back. And we let that derail us. And, and then we, we let that form a narrative about marketing in general, that I shouldn't be doing this anymore. What you don't know is, you know, last night, that person was in the hospital all night with their grandma who was dying. And, you know, you're the first email that they saw in the morning and they snapped. Like, you you don't know what the story is. You don't know why they responded that way. We have to learn to be able to just brush that off, be professional always, but recognize that, like, I've sent tens of thousands of marketing emails and I've had, like, I don't even know three responses, like three angry responses in all of that time? Am I really going to let those three angry responses keep me from ever sending another marketing email ever again and, and letting my business fail because one person got upset? And so, you know, there's a confidence that comes along with this. I think a confidence in, in what you have to offer, but a recognition that, yeah, sometimes it doesn't work and that's okay too. I mean, every time you walk into a retail outlet, you get approached by a sales member. Do you, do you buy every single time one of the sales staff comes up to you and tries to sell you something? No. Do you stop going back to the store ever again because they came up and tried to sell you something? No. You still go back because you might need something eventually or you do need something eventually. I think we just have to have that same approach, right? You, eventually, you're going to find the person that they're going to be so thrilled that you reached out and they're going to hire you and you're going to have an incredible relationship. And it's going to make it, you're going to be like, why didn't I do more of this? Yeah. Yes. Why don't you do more of this? And sometimes that person that has said no the first time, if you don't get, uh, you know, fearful that, oh, my goodness, oh, no, they, they don't like me there. No, if it just wasn't the, the right time, but you keep, you know, you follow up two, three months later and whatever. And if you notice that they still open your emails and maybe they won't for the next six months or the next year, but then all of a sudden, hey, I am, yeah, I, I received your, your demo like a year ago. Um, I think your voice is good for this. You know, just think crazy things like that have happened to me, I think to you as well. So I think every voice actor that's done email marketing has had that happen at some point. And that's one of my favorite things about Playbook because I've been doing Playbook for so long now. I, you know, I, I get people that reach out to me and, and say, you know, I, I sent an email to this person in 2018 and never heard anything back. And now, you know, today they just hired me for a job or whatever. Like you just, you don't know, right? You, you don't know. So you put yourself out there with confidence because you're great at what you do. And you know that what you do is going to make somebody else's life, job, project better, easier, more fun. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about now how uh, your podcast has been evolving because um, you started, I think, in 2019 or 2018, I believe. Um, Jeez, good question. Yeah. yeah, probably around there. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I don't know, 200 and some odd episodes in at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been evolving because first you started, you were the sole narrator. And yeah. uh, I think it was a little bit of an extension of, of, playbook, of uh, playbook. I'm sorry, I speak for a living, of yeah. course. Um, and so where you're, you know, you're talking about the, the most important things, things that are super helpful that, that, uh, help people with with all different areas of, of their business. Uh, and then you started to do interviews, which was really interesting. You know, I was lucky enough to be in one of those and uh, I'll link to that in the show notes. A lot of people yep. have said that they've liked that. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, but and now you are um, I mean, and you do the summer series, which I think it's great. You do shorter versions, you know, and so I, I just see it constantly evolving in different ways, which um, are really, really nice. How do you see your podcast going or growing now or, or changing in like in the coming year, like for 2024? I mean, the summer series episodes, I, I'm not going to lie. The summer series episodes are completely selfish. That is uh, <laughs> the pod. I mean, you do a podcast, you know how much work a podcast is, oh, you yeah. know how much time goes into creating a podcast. And yes. so uh, with the summer series, I, I started doing that. I, this may be the third, the third or fourth summer, I guess maybe the third summer. I'm not sure that I've been doing the summer series episodes. And the whole entire purpose of those was give me quick episodes, quick hit episodes that I can get in, get out, get done. And I can batch a bunch of them. I can get them done like and, and I can get, you know, four or six or eight weeks ahead and give myself a little bit of a break. Right. So they're, they're completely selfish. What I did do differently this year for the summer series in the past, they've just been, you know, me talking about a particular subject. You know, I grab a question that somebody shared on social media or whatever. 
Uh, what I decided to do this year for the for the 2023 summer series was to invite people onto the show. And basically it's like a mini coaching session, right? You get <laughs> you get to come on the show, you get to ask me one question, I give you one answer. And and chances are if you're thinking about that question, there are other voice actors that are out there thinking about it too. Um, I was opposed to interviews for so long because I was afraid of how much work it was going to be. That's that's the God's honest truth. I just was like, I I only have so much capacity. I only have so much time. And if I got to start editing interviews and dealing with other people's audio quality and, and just the editing that goes along with all that sort of stuff. And I was like, I'm just, it scares me. But one of my favorite podcasts to listen to, and I don't get to listen to it as often as I would like, is the Tim Ferriss show. Uh -huh. Anybody that like... I need I I need more long drives in my life so that I can listen to Tim Ferriss. <laughs> yeah, because I'm with his, you, on that you know, one. some of his episodes are like three hours long, right? Yeah. I don't normally have three hours to just sit down and listen to a podcast. It's but crazy. Yeah. One of the things that I that I like and, and he and he talked like his whole episode, like the whole purpose of his show is, you know, deconstructing successful people and, mm -hmm. and trying to understand what it is that makes them think the way they think or work the way they work or do what they do or or whatever. And and I, I really bought into that concept. And I heard another podcast that I listened to. I heard the host talk about how every time he brought a guest on, he felt like he was getting a masterclass. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking like, look, there's only so much talking about marketing that I can do, right? And people have heard it all or, you know, they don't want to hear it anymore or whatever. But there are a lot of other people out there that have expertise in a lot of other different areas. And maybe if they were given access to the platform... You know, they've got things to share and, and teach. And so because not everybody has access to a, a platform or a, a big audience or, or whatever. Right. And so I started looking at, OK. Who can I bring on the show that can teach something? Right. So I stay true to the premise of the show, which is all about the business and marketing side of voiceover and, and you know, actionable, actionable, practical advice. That's my whole thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. But I open up the, the floor to to some other people and I try really hard to not just bring on the usual guests, right? There, there are certain people that just they're the most respected coaches, producers, mentors, et cetera, in the industry. And they do all the conferences and they do all the podcasts and they do all the shows and, and whatever. And that's fine because they've got a ton of value to add. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other people out there, I think who have expertise, even if it's just in one subject or one area, who never get a chance to talk because they're not one of those recognized coaches, producers, whatever. So if the show is the everyday VOpreneur, can I find these everyday VOpreneurs, give them a platform and learn something? And so that's that's kind of what finally started it was, was that desire to, you know, evolve the show uh, not just have it be all about me, still be able to provide massive value. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I said, I, I want to help people succeed. I, there's people that have come on my podcast and they've been able to leverage being on my podcast into getting a speaking slot at VO Atlanta or One Voice where they previously couldn't get it. Hmm. Or they've been able to leverage that into getting in with another organization, getting on with like a gravy for the brain and, and getting a chance to teach a class or, you know, several of them have, have ultimately created their own class. And, and you know, the podcast was maybe a, a launching platform or, or a starting place for them. It really is my heart to just help people grow their businesses. And so I think that that's kind of what, that's kind of where it evolved into that. Uh, and so... Come fall, you know, September rolls around, summer series is over, and and I hope to just go right back to finding a bunch of cool people that can share their story and and talk about what they know or what they're great at or what they have to offer, and and you know we just keep helping people. That's that's the goal. Well, I think that's amazing. I think that uh, that type of interview uh, really has a lot of value, helps a lot of people. I think it's just wonderful. So I, I'm really looking forward to you just continuing that that sort of interview uh, going on, because as you say, there's a lot of people that you know that uh, that that are not like the typical uh, famous coaches or producers, but um, 
but yeah, that, that have some things and, and some sort of insight that hasn't been tapped into before. And, yeah. uh, and yeah, I, 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 it's a gem. So I, I think that's wonderful that, that you continue with that. And, um, uh, well, before we close, I wanted to, uh, also ask you if you could share like one of the biggest obstacles that you've had to overcome in your career. Oh, biggest obstacle that I've had to overcome in my career. I just needed to learn how to run a business. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I really, I really think that probably sounds like an easy answer, but I really, that's what I really had to figure out. I have been through transitions in this voiceover industry because I've been in it a while and I've seen it go from uh, an agent commercial demo model to I was there for the rise of, of online casting and, and that shifted focus away from agents to a degree. Um, I've, I, I was, I like to believe that I was one of the, you know, we're talking godfathers. I would like to believe that I was one of the godfathers of the, of the marketing movement for voice actors. I mean, I recognized when I started seeing online casting start to slide a little bit, I mean, late, you know, like 2009, 10, somewhere in there, right? But when I was going full time um, and started doing my own marketing. And so that's another transition that we've gone through. And, and, and you know, what's going to happen with AI now? And how's that going to impact us? And, exactly. and what kind of disruption does that bring? And I, I don't know. But the reason why I've been able to make it through all of these transitions is because I never just saw myself as a voice actor. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I did initially, but overcoming that and just seeing myself as a business owner, I think was, it was a huge part of that in, in helping me to learn some of the lessons that I've learned, helping me to, to see things differently. You know, like that's, I watched I call them the glory days of online casting, like that period, like we'll say pre-2012. Um, I watched as some of the sites changed and, you know, voice actors who were six-figure voice actors on some of those platforms all of a sudden saw their incomes drop to next to nothing because of the way that the platforms changed and they're stuck because they don't know any other way to do it, right? Like, mm -hmm. now what? I saw that coming and had started marketing at that point so that when my casting site income started dripping or dropping off, I had figured out ways to bring in other income from other clients in order to make up the difference and then ultimately massively exceed it. And so if I hadn't adapted that mentality, you know, I, I wouldn't be here on the show right now. I'd be yeah. working a drive through a McDonald's or something. So for sure, I mean, that was a huge, I don't know if it's necessarily an obstacle, but it was a, it was an eye opener. Mm -hmm. it, it was an eye opener. And I think that made the difference between me, you know, making some money in voiceover or maybe being a mediocre voice actor or whatever to, you know, being able to run a, a legitimate and successful voiceover business. Yeah. I think that's one thing that a lot of us, um, have been discovering, you know, uh, that we've made this, I mean, I, uh, on my part, I can say I'm, I'm not on online casting sites as much. I mean, I'm only on one right now, but yep. that used to be a big part of my business before that. And I'm one of the people that suffered a lot from that. And it, it yep. cost me a lot to, to get out of that and, and start to develop that, that business mindset and, and, and everything. Um, also what helped me hugely, I think for me, a, a very big turning point was, uh, when I started, the, the mastermind group with, that you led, um, you know, I was, uh, one of the, the people in there. And, and I think that that helped me a lot, um, in just realizing all of the things that I could do. Uh, and one of the biggest things there was putting, setting goals, but putting dates to those goals, yeah. which is something deadlines. that we, yeah, deadlines, like hard yeah. deadlines. Cause if we don't do that, we just never do it. We're like, yeah, one of these days I need to do a broadcast narration demo Keep and kicking the can down the road. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, that if people can, can start doing that, you know, people that might be hearing us and saying, okay, you know what? Yeah. I need to make that shift. I need to see myself as a business now. And yeah, we wear all sorts of hats. 
You know, we, yeah. we do our admin, we, we do our marketing. We, of course, need to do the artistic side and, and, and evolve as, 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 uh, you know, as voice actors, uh, network as well. If we're super shy, but we know that sometimes going to, um, you know, conferences and not only voiceover conferences, but, but of, of, of the creators, you know, the, the, yep. the people that, that hire us, um, that, that's also something very important that, that we need to do. And, um, so you talk about all of that and, and, uh, I think that's amazing. Um, so what is one of the things that, uh, that you would like to see change in, in the industry? I mean, uh, you've seen all sides of it. Uh, what is one thing that we're not doing enough of that would help us? I think we're still trying to do things the old fashioned way. Mm. I still see coaches that, that teach you get, get your commercial demo, get your narration demo, get an agent, right? Like, yeah, that's how it worked 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, not necessarily how it works today, not how it has to work today. Um, you know, I can, I, I've got people that I've been working with personally for, you know, three, four, five years who are still in the same position that they were in three or four or five years ago because they know what they have to do, but they're constantly finding an excuse to not do it. Look, marketing's hard. Online casting's easy, right? Marketing is hard. Sitting back and waiting for auditions from your agent is easy. Uh, okay, great. How's that working out for you five years later when you, you know, you're not making any more money and you're still struggling to survive? Um, I think that this industry is going to change whether you keep up with it or not. And, and I think that there's already a segment of people who have gotten left behind because they're still trying to do everything the way that it's always been done or, or trying to do it the old fashioned way or trying to do it the easy way. And I think, you know, that doesn't just apply to voiceover. This is just life and business period, right? Like, you know, the people sitting back trying to do it the easy and comfortable way are not the people that are disrupting industries. They're not the people that are making money. They're not the people that are finding success. They're not the people that are getting the credits or, or whatever. And so I just see, I don't know if complacency is the right word to a degree. I think, I think there's a lot of complacency. Um, but I think that there's a lot of people that have an unrealistic expectation about what it takes to succeed still. Mm -hmm. And and partly because they're being taught that by outdated methods, maybe. Uh, you know, the internet has given everybody a platform, even people who maybe shouldn't have a platform. You know, you can... You can find somebody who will tell you what you want to hear. You can find a coach or a YouTube channel or whatever that'll tell you what you want to hear to, that you think is how the industry works. But that doesn't necessarily make it true just because somebody says it in a YouTube video or sells it to you in an online course or promises you instant fame and riches and glory or, you know, just do this and you're going to make a hundred thousand. Do you know how many people got told they could make six figures a year if they just signed up for a Fiverr account and how many of those people are actually making six figures a year? Yeah, because they're looking know. for the easy way. They're looking mm -hmm. for the quick way. They're, they're, you know, and, and so I just still see so much of that. And I guess the frustration for me is as a coach, as somebody who's built a business, built a successful business and who like just desperately tries to, to point people in the right direction. Yes. I sell classes. Yes. I sell coaching, but I give a lot away. Mm -hmm. Like, you do. You could, you could learn how to build a successful business just by going back to my YouTube channel and old podcast episodes, right? You could get the enough information from there. So it's like, I'm here and I'm giving it to you and I'm trying to show you the way and you're spinning your wheels doing all of these other things that don't move the needle and it's all wasted time. So many people that could have successful businesses by now, if they had just started doing what they should have done a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, whatever. Uh, so, I mean, that's the one thing. And I don't, that's not specifically a voiceover thing. I don't even, maybe that's a generational thing. I don't know. I just wish that, I just wish people would be more willing to just hustle and tap into their own potential. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think a lot of people make a bunch of excuses or for yeah. some reason they, they just don't take the plunge into just, you know, doing Do the thing. Exactly. 
Do you have do the thing? Do you have that in one of your T-shirts? You know, you know, you you sell the swag. I do have a do the thing T-shirt. I have to get that. I have to get that one. I love it. Yes, it's really do the thing. Otherwise, the this thing. this podcast wouldn't be up right now if I hadn't done the thing. Yeah, I mean, so, it, yeah, it's you know, you go to a conference, you 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 come home fired up. You got twenty five pages of notes. You had, you know, you spent four days with the best of the best of the best of the coaches and mentors and producers that the industry has to offer. And then you get home and then you sleep for a day because you didn't sleep all weekend. (laughs) And then what do you do? Do you take your notes and do you turn them into action items or do you just go back to doing whatever you're comfortable with and and whatever is easy? And, you know, I'm just going to keep submitting some more auditions on online casting or like, just do the thing. Yeah, exactly. Do the thing. So in order for people to do the thing, where can they find you? Everything that I do now, for the most part, is on Veopreneur.com. Uh, that's a that's a brand that I serendipitously stumbled upon several years ago. And at the time, I didn't really know what I had other than a cool name. And I registered the domain just to make sure. Uh, finally trademarked it a couple of years ago. Um, but any anything that I have to offer, and I mean, you can find it all there, right? You can find my my premium classes. You can find my one-on-one coaching and all that sort of stuff. But you'll also find the podcast. You'll find free advice Friday, you'll find all the different free oh. resources that I offer. Like everything now everything is, is, there. Uh, is on veopreneur.com. Okay. It's, so uh, people, back to the hub. people can sign up for fee- for, uh, for your Facebook page for free advice Friday there as well in the, in the, yeah, every, okay. everything is on there. Yep. Oh, oh, that's wonderful. Okay. So people do the thing. Now you have no excuses. That's right. <laughs> Definitely. Mark, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And, and it's it's a long time coming. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy that you finally came and, and, and talked to us and gave us all your golden nuggets. I appreciate it, man. I love I love being able to do it. And uh, it's uh, you're, you're a good interview. You should you should do a podcast. You're really good at this interview. <laughs> yeah, thing. let me think about it. I mean, I might need to do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mark. And uh, well, um, we'll just uh, stay tuned uh, with the Veopreneur podcast and, and your free advice Friday and, and keep evolving our business because that's the, the right way to do it. Right on. Thank okay. you so much, Nikki. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on La Pizarra. Want to listen to more episodes? Visit lapizarrapodcast.com or nikimondalini.com slash lapizarra, where you can sign up for our newsletter and get exclusive previews of future episodes, as well as resources for your creative business. Tune in next week for another interesting interview.